Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining the Bare Metal to Private Cloud session today. This is Travis Wright, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft. Today's session is on hardware and prerequisite software platform for building out your private cloud. The previous session was a sort of, uh, the idea was to take a look at where we're headed. So beginning with the end in mind, we talked about using the cloud services management pack with the system center suite to be able to manage and operate your private cloud. Um, in this session, we're gonna talk about what types of hardware go into building out a private cloud and uh, what the prerequisite software platform is for deploying a private cloud infrastructure as well as the uh, kind of base requisites for installing System Center. So with that, let's just go ahead and get started here. Um, first, I wanna talk about the private cloud architecture and some concepts. Some of this type of thing may be familiar to you, but I wanna make sure that everybody has a baseline of, of what we're talking about here and how a private cloud is, is different from other types of virtualization solutions that you may have been using. And hopefully everybody already has a pretty good understanding of virtualization at this point. Um, that'll definitely be necessary to know going into this session here. So, you know, if you look back a few years ago and this whole virtualization process started, the idea was that you would, you know, either for the purpose of server consolidation or maybe for hardware retirement purposes as some older hardware became, uh, you know, sort of out of date and needed to be replaced, you could virtualize those workloads that were running on those physical servers and run them on one new physical host. So this was a great cost savings for customers as they uh, were able to move off of older, less efficient hardware and onto a more consolidated uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are some problems with that though. Um, you know, just a couple of examples are that, uh, you know, if you need to maintain that underlying physical server, if you need to patch it or reboot it or uh, whatever, you lose all of the virtual machines that are running on that physical server, uh, at least for the period of time that you're rebooting it. <laughs> so that was kind of one problem. And it also was a little bit inflexible in terms of how you could move around workloads and that kind of thing. It would typically involve downtime in order to be able to move from one host to another. So that sort of bred this idea of a private cloud and the private cloud architecture looks a little something more like this, where you have um, multiple physical virtual machine hosts, which are grouped together into a host cluster. And each of those hosts is connected to the network, as well as a, typically people will use a SAN uh, for storage purposes. And so the virtual machine hard drives would be stored on the SAN. And really the only thing that's stored on the physical servers in terms of data is the configuration of the VMs. And then you can move one VM from one host to another by simply you know, effectively copying the virtual machine configuration files from one server to another, leaving the virtual hard disks in place on the SAN. And that way it becomes really easy to move a workload inside of a virtual machine from one host to another. So you know, this is just sort of a, a diagram of what it, what it might look like if you had a private cloud set up like this where you had a, a, a host cluster, you had virtual machines running on the host and so on. And then, um, you know, if you needed to reboot one of those servers or patch it, maintain it, whatever, uh, or you needed to take it out of the cluster for some other reason, you simply move the virtual machine from one host to another, reboot that machine, and then put that virtual machine back onto the host. And uh, you know, System Center can help automate the process of doing that and, and so on. Now, another sort of good thing about this type of architecture is that if you have one virtual machine which is being used excessively for a certain period of time, System Center can help you dynamically optimize the placement of VMs that are running on that same virtual machine. So if one virtual machine starts going crazy and is having a, a higher than expected workload, you can take the other virtual machines that are running on that host and move them to other hosts within the cluster to uh, sort of load balance the, the work and make sure that that one virtual machine, which is running pretty hot, has the capacity to be able to fulfill its, its demand. Okay, and then, uh, you know, it's possible to scale out your private cloud. So as you you, you know, if you have a, a large number of virtual machines that you want to run, 
you can either build bigger and bigger clusters instead of having, for example, a four node cluster, you could have an eight node cluster or even a 16 node cluster, um, or you can add additional clusters. So you could have, a, in this example I have here, two four node clusters, and each cluster has some set of VMs running on it. And those clusters could share a central SAN, or you could have a SAN per cluster, or the SANs could, um, you know, you can have multiple SANs connected to each cluster. So there's lots of flexibility there in terms of how you architect and scale out the solution. <clears throat> now, all of this taken together is, you know, kind of what we call the fabric. So the fabric is the hosts and the host clusters, whether it's running Hyper-V or VMware, it doesn't matter. The networking, so that includes things like logical networks, MAC address pools, load balancers, VIP templates, and so on, as well as the storage. So we call this the fabric. And the idea is that you drop virtual machines onto the fabric. And as a person is deploying a virtual machine, I don't really care where the virtual machine ends up running, like on which host, or even in which host cluster. I don't really care because System Center is going to take care of provisioning that virtual machine in a place which is in accordance with what with the parameters that I've set for that particular virtual machine. So if I say, for example, that this virtual machine needs to run with at least eight gigabytes of RAM and it needs uh, four cores, you know, whatever it might be, then System Center can find an appropriate host and uh, host cluster for that to run on and, and deploy it there. So the idea is that you no longer worry about which host you're running on, which host cluster you're running on, which network it's connected to, and so on. You define your parameters as part of the virtual machine declaration, and then you drop the virtual machine onto the fabric, and from that point on, that virtual machine may move around from one host to another, or even from one host cluster to another, um, but you don't really care so long as the parameters are met for that particular virtual machine according to its configuration. Now, if you look inside of the Virtual Machine Manager console, this idea of the fabric is reflected actually in the user experience. There's a fabric workspace inside of the Virtual Machine Manager console, and up here you can see the hosts. They're organized into host groups. This is a host cluster here. Inside of that host cluster, there would be uh, the hosts that are in that cluster. Other Virtual Machine Manager components like library servers, Pixie servers, update servers, and even VMware vCenter servers show up here as part of the fabric as well. And then you can see where we can um, view the, the logical networks, MAC address pools, load balancers, bit templates, and uh, storage uh, components as well. So this is, again, what we call the fabric. <clears throat> okay, so with that, I'll just pause here real quick and see if there's any questions so far. Okay, so um, first question is, will the slides from this series be available for download? Uh, yes, at the conclusion of the series, I'll make the slides available for download from, from somewhere. Um, okay, next question is, is there a concept of a demand start and stop of a virtual machine? For example, if a machine is configured to solve a particular problem, but it is only needed a couple of hours per day, can it be configured to start when the user tries to connect to it and shuts it down when he logs out? Um, there, are, there are some ways that you can do this kind of thing. Um, one way is to have a run book run inside of Orchestrator, for example. Orchestrator is the workflow engine for System Center. So you could have an Orchestrator run book that was running on a schedule and it would turn some virtual machine or virtual machines on or off through Virtual Machine Manager on a schedule. Uh, you could also have, um, you know, trying to start a virtual machine when, when a user tries to connect to it is a little tricky because I don't know how you would capture the, the notion that somebody is trying to connect to a server that was off. Um, but you can certainly respond to dynamic events provided that um, something like Operations Manager can discover that event happening. So for example, um, you could say that you have a performance counter that Operations Manager is monitoring that looks at the number of web page requests on a web server. And if that value drops below a certain threshold, like, I don't know, 10 requests per second or something like that, 
that can generate um, an alert inside of Operations Manager, which could then trigger an orchestrator run book that would turn that VM off. So those types of things are certainly possible. Um, Duck is a little bit trickier when you're trying to respond to certain events that are happening, but Virtual Machine Manager has some built-in capabilities to do dynamic um, optimization. So basically, if one virtual machine starts using more or less CPU, we can um, move those virtual machines around from one host to another uh, in order to balance out the load. So some of that type of stuff is just kind of automatic and comes out of the box. Okay, um, the fabric mentioned in System Center will have a smooth coexistence with the VMware V fabric, right? Um, yes, I mean, there's nothing that <clears throat> is sort of overlapping there <clears throat> technology-wise. There's some conceptual alignment there, um, but there, there's nothing there that technology-wise overlaps, so there shouldn't be any issues with compatibility there. Okay, with that, we're kind of uh, out of questions in the queue, but feel free to keep dropping questions into the queue, and at certain times in the presentation, I'll stop and answer those. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing here is uh, for the purposes of this series that I'm doing here, I went down to the Enterprise Engineering Center, which is on the Redmond campus. Uh, it's located in Building 25. And the Enterprise Engineering Center is really a very high-end test lab facility for our customers and partners to come in and test out new versions of Microsoft products using you know, really high-end, high-quality hardware, the type of hardware that you might expect to find in a production data center with a customer or a hoster. Uh, and you know, they provided me some, some really excellent hardware that uh, we can use to kind of showcase what a private cloud would look like using a kind of real hardware. So I definitely appreciate them allowing me to go in there for a couple weeks and, and to use their equipment. So as, as you go out to purchase your hardware for private cloud, it's, you know, you, historically you'd go out and you'd buy a web server and your web server might have, um, you know, a few processors and a, you know, a corresponding amount of RAM and essentially no disk space. You really didn't need it, so you ended up buying like a pizza box or lots of pizza boxes. And But if you were to go and buy a SQL server, you'd buy something that had a lot of processors and memory and even more disk drives. And you go buy a file, you go buy something like a file server, you probably don't need as many processors or memory, but you need a lot of storage. You know, so similarly when you go out to buy hardware for a private cloud, you need to be looking at kind of purpose-built hardware that's designed to run a private cloud. And that type of hardware that you look for would have a <clears throat> lot of RAM. So let me back up here, okay? So it would have a lot of RAM. In this case, I just pulled one example off of HP's site of a server that would be good for running a private cloud host with. In this case, you can see that this particular server has capacity for up to two terabytes of RAM. That is plenty. Um, lots of cores. So you can see in this example that we've got uh, a capacity for up to eight processors with 10 cores each. So that would be 80 cores, which is also substantial. Um, also, when you look for <clears throat> private cloud host servers, you want to look for something that has multiple NICs on it. So in this case, um, this has a four port NIC with a network controller on it. So typically the way people set this up is they'll have one NIC is used for management, so I can remote into the server or um, do that type of thing. And then typically people have multiple NICs that are set up with NIC teaming. And this increases the bandwidth capacity as well as provides for failover at the NIC level and that's used for external connectivity out to the Ethernet so that you can um, connect up to other servers that might be in the data center as well as other uh, hosts that may be hosting VMs that the VMs that are running on this host need to connect to. And then uh, typically, you, you really don't need that much storage on a, um, on a VM host. So in this case, you can see that this VM host server just has eight slots in it. You really only need, you know, like a two-spindle RAID 1 OS drive because all you're going to run on it is the operating system. Um, all of your virtual machine VHD files should be running on a SAN, ideally. So this is kind of a typical configuration for what you would see as a Hyper-V or uh, even a VMware VM host server that would be part of a host cluster. <clears throat> 
And you can see that these aren't cheap, right? But if you think about that this particular server right here could run, you know, potentially 100 virtual machines on it, that makes this cost pretty low. You know, you're looking at like $335 per server to be running on this thing. Okay. Um, so just kind of one other point I would make here is, you know, really shop around and look for what type of hardware is going to be best for you. So I just pulled two, two examples here. One is a server that has 64 cores at 2.6 gigahertz with a 16 meg cache, 120 gigs of RAM, and a four port NIC. And this particular server list price is 14,600, right? Um, these prices that I'm showing you here, these are just the list prices up on HP site. This doesn't include any sort of uh, volume-based pricing or uh, pricing based upon, you know, the sales rep and your grandma going to school at the same time or something like that. Um, and then over here we've got another server which is 40 cores at 2.4 gigahertz and 30 megs of cache and then 256 gigs of RAM with a four port NIC. So you can kind of look at this and say, okay, well, look, I can buy two of these servers and I'd end up with 128 cores versus 40 cores and the same amount of RAM, and it still cost me $25,000 less than this server. So unless you really need something with like a 30 meg cache on the processor, you're probably better off going with something like this that has the um, additional processor capacity um, and having multiple of those. So you know, something to kind of take a look at is to shop around and compare things. Um, I recommend buying as though you were buying for physical hardware. So for example, um, processors, you know, are essentially passed through to the virtual machine. So if you need something that has a lot of on-processor cache, like a, like a SQL server or something like that, then you may want to go ahead and buy something that has the 30 meg cache on the proc instead of the 16 meg. Um, but, you know, one other thing to kind of keep in mind, and, and you know, roughly speaking, you should buy enough uh, RAM and processors as though you were running as a physical load. But one thing you should keep in mind is sort of the dynamic nature of virtualization. Now with dynamic memory, you can have um, multiple virtual machines that are all over allocated the actual physical memory. And then the virtual machines contend for that memory based upon their utilization, as well as configuration settings that you have to determine who gets priority on, on accessing that memory. And the same is also roughly speaking true of processors. It's possible to overcommit processors as well. And uh, that way, you know, you you could have you could take a server that would normally run on a four or on a four processor machine and another server that runs on a four processor machine, you could put both of those on one VM host that has four uh, procs on it and you could overcommit those procs. And provided that those servers don't typically fully utilize all four of those procs, they can share the, the processor and, and uh, just schedule their time on those processors. Um, <clears throat> now, one other thing I would sort of recommend here is that you purchase different sets of hardware. So you have some sets that maybe have higher end um, memory, higher end processors, et cetera, and you have some lower end stuff that costs less, but the, the quality of it is not as good. And you put things like file servers and you know, maybe web servers and that type of thing on a low-end hardware, and you put things like SQL servers and that sort of thing on your high-end hardware. And as a central IT organization or as a hoster, you just charge your customers accordingly based upon whether they're using the low-end inexpensive hardware or the high-end expensive hardware. And that way people still have the flexibility of purchasing exactly what they need and not more and not less. And then what you can do is you can organize your your fabric according to the classification of the hardware. And we'll see how you can create um, sort of subdivided units of your fabric uh, when we go into the next session and talk about Virtual Machine Manager and the concept of clouds there. So you can kind of carve up your fabric into different classifications of hardware and then charge people accordingly, give people access to you know, more or less better quality hardware. And the same is also true of storage. So you, know, you may have a, a high-end SAN, you may have sort of a lower-end SAN, you may have uh, you know, something even like on-server on on server disk space, example, for, for example, as well. So lots of different sort of options there, but um, you kind of want to carve out your, your hardware into different classifications of hardware. Now, for the purposes of this session, this is the 
hardware that the Enterprise Engineering Center gave me. Okay, so they gave me these uh, 10 servers, okay, and they're all DL380G7s. You can see that each one of them only has one internal sort of logical drive that's comprised of two physical hard drives in a RAID 1 configuration. And this is just to run the operating system for these physical um, operating systems right here. And then um, they happen to be 2.66 um, gigahertz procs, and each server had 96 gigs of RAM. And I would, for this particular session, I was running 2008 R2 Enterprise SP1. Now, the way I carved this up was that I created two machines that are the VM hosts. So I effectively created a two-node Hyper-V host cluster using these two physical servers. Okay, and then in this case, I created a physical SQL cluster using the second two servers here, SQL A and SQL B. Now, I'm going to use the SQL cluster to store all the databases for all of System Center that we're installing. I could have run these as virtual machines on top of the uh, Hyper-V cluster. In this particular case, since I had all this physical server space and I didn't really want to mess around with setting up like a eight node um, Hyper-V cluster, it was, it was simply easier in this case for me to install uh, SQL physically on these servers. Um, but you know, this just as easily could have run as a virtual workload on top of the Hyper-V cluster. The next two servers were a virtual machine manager high availability server cluster. So this is, um, again, the same sort of story as SQL. I could have run this as a virtual workload, uh, but for these purposes, I went ahead and set this up as a physical instance. And then uh, I created a file server cluster uh, out of the next two nodes, and this is just standard Windows file server clustering here, nothing fancy. Uh, and again, this could have been a virtual workload. And then the last two servers here are just sort of utility servers. One was an Active Directory server. That's a pretty beefy Active Directory server with 96 gigs of RAM. Uh, and then uh, we had a jump box. So the jump box just allowed me to connect from our corporate network into this isolated network that the these hosts were running in. OK, and then. Um, this was the SAN configuration. So we had an EMC VNX 7500. We had 27 physical 200 gigabyte SSD drives. I used this to store all of the SQL log files on. And then we had 138 physical drives at 600 gigs a pop that were SAS disks. And all the other storage LUNs used those. And this particular SAN has a 47 gig cache on it. So the way that I did this is I, <coughs> carved up a bunch of LUNs out of the SAN. The first LUN here that you see is the V drive on the VM host cluster, and this is where I put all of the virtual machine VHD files. And then we had a quorum drive that was just a small one gigabyte quorum drive that uh, allows these two nodes to communicate to each other using that disk space there. All of these LUNs that you see here are allocated for SQL database and like SQL database data and log files for all the system center databases. So it's maybe a little overkill, but I went ahead and created a LUN for each database data file and each log file so that they had uh, independence and they could run on their own set of, um, of logical um, space there on SAN. Okay, and then there's also one gig quorum drive that allows this cluster to talk to each other. Um, I think this is actually a typo here. I don't think we exposed a one terabyte um, storage to the VMM cluster. That wouldn't be necessary. There's also a quorum drive here. And then we created a one terabyte uh, file share for the file server cluster. And then also a quorum drive there. <clears throat> so this is the resulting topology that we have. So we have uh, the VM host cluster, we have the file server cluster, the SQL cluster, and the virtual machine manager cluster. And they're all connected to this one SAN. And all of these host, all these uh, physical machines are connected together over the test LAN. And then um, when, you'll see that when we set up Hyper-V on these, um, these nodes here, we'll create a virtual uh, network adapter that allows all the virtual machines to also talk out onto this test LAN here as well. And then um, 
we have the domain controller and the jump box that bridges between the CorpNet uh, network as well as the test network. So with that, I'll pause again and see if there's uh, any questions before we go on to the software configuration section. <clears throat> Um, all right, so let's take the first question here. Is my application hosted on cloud tied up to one system or any system available to you during that time? Well, uh, I'll, I'll assume for now that what you mean by application is that you have a, a single virtual machine that contains your application. So your virtual machine will be running on one particular host at any given time, but based upon what's going on, on the host cluster and the other virtual machines that may be moved from one host to another. Uh, but given the uh, live migration capabilities of both Hyper-V and VMware, your virtual machine can be moved from one host to another without any downtime. Okay, the next question is, is there any RAID requirements in configuring private cloud software, hardware, RAID 1, or sorry, RAID 0, RAID 10, RAID 1, RAID 5, et cetera? So uh, my recommendation on this is to, um, to, you know, first of all, your hosts, as I mentioned earlier, the hosts really don't have any data storage requirements. So I would recommend just a, st a simple RAID 1 drive there just for redundancy purposes for the operating system. Uh, as far as the storage for your virtual machine VHD files, you know, I'd recommend probably a, uh, you know, like a RAID 1 or a RAID 5 configuration there. And then um, as, you, as you noticed here, I carved out um, specific LUNs for the database data and log files. So that, that um, I wasn't storing that data within the VHD file. I was going directly to the SAN and uh, storing that data on a particular LUN on the SAN. Okay, um, next one is one of the problems we found with SCVMM 2008 was a lack of warnings around actions being performed against VMware. No prompt to confirm deletion of VM data from disk. Is this integration improved in SCVMM 2012? Um, you know, I'm going to have to pass on that question. I really haven't used Virtual Machine Manager that much with VMware, um, so I'd have to check with some of my coworkers in, in that one. Um, which vendor has the best hardware for maximum VM density? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really probably couldn't make a, a recommendation there. I mean, any of the big hardware vendors have pretty comparable hardware. So, I, I, you know, just sort of shop around, see who's got the latest and greatest stuff. But you know, anything that you get from any of the big hardware vendors like Dell or HP, uh, IBM, et cetera, will have um, very high density possibilities with their with their hardware. Um, okay, when a system has 12 cores on it, is there a best practice for provisioning virtual systems based on the physical cores? So the general guidance that Microsoft gives is um, one virtual core per physical core, okay? And some people, there's kind of like this, uh, perception out there that if you have, if you over allocate virtual cores that will become a problem because you'll have virtual machines um, conflicting for processor time, for scheduling processor time. Um, and that's certainly true if you had all of the cores being used all of the time. You know, so if you had a, let's, let's, let's say you had a physical server that had four cores on it and you had four VMs running on it and each core within each VM was being um, utilized 100%, then that's not going to leave any processor time for the host. Okay, so that's kind of one thing you have to worry about. Um, the way that Hyper-V works, though, is that it reserves a certain percentage of the processor time for the host, so you actually don't have to um, worry too much about the host processor time being allocated. Um, Hyper-V, by default, reserves 20% of the uh, host processor time, or sorry, 20% of the processor time for the host that is configurable 
personally, I'd drop it down to about 10% unless your host is doing something else besides running the VMs. Um, so, you know, as long as you're, you know, basically, I think about it like this. If I've got um, four cores and I stand up, you know, 40 virtual machines on there, and I allocate each of those virtual machines um, four cores, well, now I've got 160 virtual cores allocated. But if each of those virtual cores is doing essentially nothing, then the physical cores aren't going to be busy either. So, you know, it really just kind of comes down to the process utilization of the virtual cores inside of the VMs in determining how much you can over allocate the physical cores uh, as virtual cores. So, you know, it's it just one of those things that really depends. Um, think about it as a pool of processing capacity, and you can allocate that out across the, um, the virtual machines as needed, depending upon their process utilization. And just make sure that you don't over allocate the process or utilization. Don't, don't worry about so much about allocating, over allocating the cores themselves. Worry about over allocating process or utilization. That's kind of the way to think about it. Okay. Um, why you didn't use uh, CSV for Hyper-V cluster? Uh, you know, I certainly could have no particular reason. Um, there's lots of different options for that. So uh, in this particular case, I chose to use a, a SAN. Um, why separate clusters versus one big cluster? Uh, you know, this maybe comes down to um, some financial decisions, right? So if I'm going to build, uh, build out my data center, I may want to um, build it in smaller scale units so that I have, um, I can build out, uh, you know, pieces at a time. So I can start with a four node cluster and I can build another four node cluster, I can build another four node cluster, et cetera. Um, but you could just as easily start with a four node cluster and then fold in another four nodes into that same cluster. So, you know, it really doesn't matter too much either way whether you're doing um, multiple clusters versus one big cluster. Um, we can move virtual machines from one host to another within a cluster, or we can move virtual machines from one host in one cluster to another host in another cluster. It doesn't really matter, provided that the, the network links are there and, uh, you know, that the, that the storage is shared. So I think probably the bigger concern there is not so much um, how many clusters you have versus how many nodes you have in each cluster, but uh, making sure that the... Um, that the storage that you want to be able to kind of share between clusters is, is set up is such that you can easily move the Hyper-V or VMware machines from one node to another. Um, wow, lots of questions. This is great. So how do you get an accurate count of the number of Windows, SQL, et cetera, licenses you need to have as you reconfigure the number of virtual machines? Um, this is definitely a big challenge, especially when you get into situations where you have virtual machines that are kind of being spun up dynamically. They run for a little while and then they get spun down, you know. And, and so at some points in time, I might have 10 web servers running. At other points in time, I might have 100 web servers running. So I'm actually going to skip on that question. Um, this is something that, you know, you, you need to take up with your software vendors to make sure that you're licensing correctly based upon your dynamic utilization of the, of the licenses. I know that Microsoft, as well as other software vendors, are uh, you know, this is a challenge for them to figure out with their customers how to accurately charge for utilization of software in these dynamic situations. So, um, you know, similarly, you know, there's, there's software out there like Configuration Manager, Operations Manager, et cetera, that can discover the number of instances of things that you have and can help you at least inventory what you have. Um, but, uh, you know, turning that into a license count and that kind of thing is, is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, there is a company called Provence, which has built a asset management solution on top of System Center Service Manager, and that does have a license management capability as part of it. So you can actually uh, import the number of licenses that you've purchased, and then you can allocate those licenses to machines and or users and kind of keep track of it that way. So that's kind of a slick, um, slick way to handle it. Okay. Um, 
So just a comment here of the options he mentioned, RAID 10 is the best combination of perform perf redundancy, but it's also the most expensive. That's absolutely true. Um, personally, I don't think that the additional perf benefits that you get from RAID 10 over RAID 5 is worth the additional storage expense. Uh, so I don't normally recommend RAID 10 for anything other than really high-end data or log file uh, storage. Um, Okay, and this particular question here is, was the service manager database and service manager data warehouse separated into different instances? Uh, in this particular case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all of the system center databases are in one SQL Server instance. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute as far as whether that's a good idea or not. Um, okay. So let's go on now to the software section. So here we'll talk about the prerequisite software platform. So in terms of Windows considerations, uh, you can use Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1 standard or enterprise. Um, I definitely recommend using that for Hyper-V right now versus the older versions of Windows Server because um, the 2008 R2 version has support for more vCPUs and um, dynamic memory, which is a huge cost saver in terms of having high-density virtual machine. Uh, Windows Server 2012, as you know, is, um, is out in a beta format right now. Uh, RC, you've probably heard rumors, is coming relatively soon. Um, so the uh, you know, Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V is a big step forward. I mean, I, we're, we won't have time to cover the differences here in this series, but I definitely recommend checking out some things on the web to see what the differences are, how that stacks up to VMware, and uh, I think you'll see that um, Hyper-V has really come a long ways between the Server 2008 R2 and Server 2012. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that Windows Server 2012 is not supported for System Center 2012 yet. That means running System Center 2012 on Windows Server 2012, as well as having System Center 2012 manage Windows Server 2012. Uh, there is a System Center 2012 vNext CTP1 that's out there right now, and it only has uh, virtual machine manager updates and data protection manager updates in it. Um, so to the extent that it's possible in that CTP1 release with the new features that are available there, you can manage Windows Server 2012 with that CTP release. But um, you know, unless you're a TAP customer, that is not a supported configuration to run in production yet. Um, and then uh, just kind of one other thing I would point out here is, you know, unless you have a strong need to otherwise, I would recommend using the ENUS version of the operating system. It's the version that we do the most testing with, so in theory it should be the most reliable versus some issues that you may run into running other languages of the uh, operating system. And it's fine if you have a need to run it in another language. Um, it, it really shouldn't be a problem in most cases, um, but you're just more likely to have better reliability because we test more on ENUS. Okay, in terms of SQL Server, this, is, this gets a little tricky here. Um, so right now, SQL Server 2008 R2 standard or enterprise SP1 is the supported SQL Server version across the board in System Center 2012. Some of the components in System Center 2012 support other older versions of SQL Server 2008, but um, this is kind of the standard thing. If you're deploying a new instance of System Center, this is the version of SQL Server that you should be using. Um, although SQL Server 2020, or 2012 is released, it is not supported yet for running System Center on it. Um, we will announce the time frame for when we will support that at some point uh, pretty soon, but um, as of right now, it's not supported. Uh, you know, so going back to this question that somebody had about the SQL Server instances. In this case, for, for this session, I did deploy all of the System Center components on a single SQL Server instance. Um, that is really something that depends on the scale of your deployment. If it's a lab environment, um, uh, 
you know, pre-production environment, a development test environment, that's absolutely fine. Uh, if you have a very small deployment, like a departmental deployment or something like that, it's probably fine. Uh, but as you get up into the much larger organizations, um, you're either going to have to have a really big SQL server or you're going to need to, uh, to spread it out across multiple SQL instances, potentially running on either multiple physical SQL servers or multiple um, virtual machines. Now, one thing that I'm personally trying to drive here within the System Center engineering team is this idea that the number of SQL clusters required to deploy System Center with separate instances for every component is just huge. You know, you think about if I deployed all of the seven components of the System Center suite and I had a SQL cluster or two for each of those, I mean, you're talking about 15, 18 servers, something like that, um, in a hurry in order to be able to deploy everything on high availability, high availability cluster, and that's just for the databases. Uh, and that's really, you know, now that we're licensing System Center as a suite and people are buying and deploying the suite as a whole, uh, this is some of the feedback that we've gotten from people is that we need to have some guidance on how to consolidate the data storage um, onto a minimum number of SQL Server instances. So we are going to be um, providing some more guidance in that area. And, uh, you know, again, it'll come down to scale, but we do want to see people having a fewer number of SQL Server instances deployed with high availability that are running um, the multiple databases for the System Center components. So I think that's, the, generally speaking, the direction that we're heading. Um, but, you know, definitely, as you get up into the higher scale deployments here, you're going to want to engage with um, somebody that has some system center expertise, some kind of partner there to help you kind of right size the SQL server deployment. Now, the collation requirements have been quite tricky. We've actually been going through a lot of um, discussion here on the engineering team about this. Um, and I ended up writing a lengthy blog post that you can read by going to this URL here about the collation compatibility between the system center components and in particular the operations manager component and the service manager component. Uh, if you want to be safe, then use the SQL Latin 1 collation for all of the system center components. That is a supported collation across the board for um, system center. The service manager setup will warn you about that if you're using that collation during installation um, there's a couple of things to think about there. One is that, and you, you can read about this in the blog post too, but one thing is that the SQL ter server team has advised us that these SQL underscore collations are, uh, you know, they're sort of outdated and they're not up to date with the latest character sets. And so um, they've encouraged us to start using the Windows server collations. So typically those would not have the SQL underscore in front of them. It would be something like Latin 1, uh, 100 general, for example. Um, so first of all, service manager is warning you that you're using a kind of outdated collation with this SQL Latin 1 collation. And secondly, it's warning you that because service manager uses full text search, and you may have data that's stored in the service manager database in a non-Latin-based language, like Chinese or Japanese or something like that. You should use a, a collation that corresponds to that language so that the full-text search works as well as possible by um, having the right word-breaking logic and that kind of thing in there. Um, <clears throat> now, if you do deploy service manager using a non-Latin collation, like let's say you deployed a service manager data warehouse using a, a, like a Chinese collation and you had operations manager deployed on a Latin collation. In that particular case, the compatibility of those two co uh, collations is such that um, it's not compatible for doing a SQL bulk data copy that we do between the operations manager database and the service manager um, data warehouse database where we store operations manager data. Now, for that particular scenario, this is a very small scenario, which is just simply that we take the alerts that are in the operations manager database and we copy them into a special data mark database inside of the service manager data warehouse. So you really only miss a small piece of functionality there if you do have that SQL collation incompatibility situation. 
Um, there's been a new one that's come up recently, which um, we're going to get to the bottom of and then add to this blog post, but I might as well make you aware of it right now. And that is that if you deploy Operations Manager on a collation, on a SQL Server instance that has a collation other than Latin, <clears throat> the collation of the Operations Manager database will be whatever the collation of the SQL Server is but the data warehouse database will always be deployed with the SQL Latin 1 collation, regardless of what the SQL Server instance collation is. And that also causes a problem in some cases with collation incompatibility um, between the operations manager database and the operations manager data warehouse. So we're gonna look into what we can do about that, but again, just to be safe on things, for now, use the SQL Latin 1 general collation across the board uh, as we go forward, the idea is that we will move to requiring the new Windows Server collations instead of the older SQL collations for any new installation of System Center while still supporting the older collations for those instances of System Center which have already been deployed on those older collations. So that's, that's quite a mouthful. Hopefully that mostly makes sense. If, if it doesn't make sense, um, you may want to read through the blog post there um, and take a look at that. Now, one thing that isn't compatible is the service manager and operations manager reporting services instances must be separated. Uh, so that's just kind of one thing to keep in mind there. Um, you know, just in general, I wouldn't, I've, I've seen a lot of people deploying System Center with multiple SQL instances, like one instance per each component. Uh, I really don't see why you would have the additional overhead of having these multiple SQL instances on the same server. Uh, if you really want to try to break it out, it's probably better to create multiple virtual machines that each have their own SQL instance, uh, and then you can uh, kind of move that around as needed, um, it, you know, in terms of performance anyway. Okay. Um, most of the system center components have a sizing tool that you can use that will help you estimate the disk space requirement for your databases. So that will help you decide what size each of the LUNs are that you carve out from the SANR to, to store your data and log files on. Um, the service manager and virtual machine manager components both require the SQL Server Analysis Services component to be installed for the data warehouse. And service manager also requires the full text search component of SQL Server uh, for the service manager and operations manager DW, or sorry, and the uh, DW staging and config database. And then, as, again, as I mentioned earlier, all of the System Center DBs will be installed on the same SQL Server instance. Okay, now just a couple notes on VMM cluster supported configurations. This one's come up quite a bit in the community, so I'll just try to clarify this for you here. Uh, you can create a VMM server cluster out of two guests that are running on a host cluster. And then you can use that VMM server cluster to manage the host that the cluster is running on. Okay, so you can use the VMM server cluster that's running in the guests to manage the host cluster that it's running on. And, but what you can't do is install a VMM server cluster on the physical nodes of that host cluster and then manage that same host cluster. You can install a VMM server cluster on the physical nodes of one host cluster and then manage a different host cluster with that VMM cluster. But I, I would think that would be a sort of rare scenario. Uh, in general, I expect that most people will have a dedicated physical server cluster for running VMM, or they will create two guests that are running on a host cluster and manage that host cluster as well as other host clusters. Those should be the most common configurations that we would see. Okay, so let's pause again now for questions. Let's see what we've got. Trying to go back here to, okay, here we go. Uh, when we use Windows Server 2012 with VMM with SP1 CTP, will it work? Um, yes, it will work. Um, there are some things that are in Windows Server 2012 that the VMM uh, vNext CTP will not support yet. So some of the additional, some of like the new features in Windows Server 2012 won't be lit up in VMM just yet. 
but you will be able to deploy VMM agents and that kind of thing to Windows Server 2012 hosts. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So, yeah, okay, it looks like you guys are answering those questions here, that's great. Um, so when will SQL 2012 be supported? Um, it, that, that will be announced here soon, but for now it's not supported, including for the Virtual Machine Manager vNext CTP1. So keep that on Windows Server, or on uh, SQL 2008 R2 for now as well. Uh, So is it better to use Windows collations than SQL collations? That's the guidance that we've been given from the SQL team is that the SQL collations are out of date at this point and the Windows collations have uh, updated character sets in them. Okay, we are planning to deploy SCOM 2012 for about 30 to 40 hosts for VM monitoring. Which are recommendations for SQL configuration related to number of instances, hard drive runs, or for SQL DBs? Um, I mean, that, that's a that's a small deployment for operations manager. So in this particular case, uh, you should just need one SQL Server instance. You can run both the operations manager DB as well as the data warehouse DB on that one server, and it should even be fine to put uh, the data and the log files for both the operations manager database as well as the operations manager DW database on a single run. Um, now, if, if, if you're monitoring just the 30 to 40 hosts, that would be fine. Now, if you if you have 30 to 40 hosts and you have you know hundreds or thousands of VMs running on those hosts and you're going to manage all of those with Ops Manager, then the conversation becomes more complex and we should talk about that maybe offline. Okay, uh, which SQL Server cumulative update did you install as SCCM requires a specific CU? So yes, SCCM 2012 requires, I think it's uh, CU6 on SQL Server 2008 R2. Um, we, th that's the only component right now that requires a specific cumulative update. So in this particular case, I did not install any cumulative updates because for this series, I didn't uh, deploy configuration manager. Okay, so that's the end of those questions in the queue there. Let's go on now. So in terms of the next steps, the next thing we're going to do is create a Hyper-V host cluster, and then we'll install the virtual machine manager cluster and we will um, then start to manage the VM host cluster from the VMM cluster. And we'll do some things like adding the file server cluster as a library server to the VMM cluster. Um, and as we go through this whole thing, I'll just kind of keep building on this diagram and show you how we deploy each of the different components um, of the System Center suite onto the fabric here and start to manage the fabric using System Center. So with that, we'll just kind of get to the, the wrap-up slide here. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Um, the next session will be on Tuesday, June 5th at 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. Just a reminder that each of these sessions is uh, Tuesday and Thursday, each uh, week from now until the end of June, except for the week of TechEd US, which is June 11th through the 15th. Uh, as I mentioned in the last session, feel free to reach out to me by email or on Twitter there. Uh, obviously, I can't be a, a personal support resource for everybody, but if you have a quick question to clarify something that we talked about today, feel free to send me an email and uh, I'll try to get back to you. So with that, let's just see if there's any last minute questions here. And if not, we'll wrap up. Okay, so the question is, uh, will this series discuss OS deployment using VMM on Hyper-V hosts? Uh, no, I'm not planning on covering that topic. That would be a good one, though. Um, I'm sure that there is a session from the Microsoft Management Summit that's on that particular topic that you can check out.
um, all of the sessions from the Microsoft Management Summit this year were recorded and put online for on-demand viewing for the first time ever. So definitely recommend going and checking out those sessions uh, for topics that we're not talking about here. Okay, so it looks like we're out of questions. Um, please, uh, please join me again on next Tuesday. Everybody have a good weekend. Thank you.